Oh, yeah. you are in danger, Close. You are way <laughs> in the reds there, buddy. I mean, the rate of fire for the 249 in this game is really accurate. Yeah. It is, and it sounds identical. It's awesome. They did a really good job with the accuracy of the equipment here. Let's go! <laughs> so I just want to wake everybody yeah. up. What's going on, everybody? It's us, the guys from Pop Culture Field Manual Podcast. I am Cameron Fath. I'm a former Army Ranger out of 2nd Ranger Battalion at Fort Lewis, Washington. And I am joined here by my beautiful co-host. I am beautiful. Israel Wright, former Green Beret, also out of Fort Lewis, Washington. I deployed to Iraq in 2008. Today, we're going to be looking at Medal of Honor. The Belly of the Beast mission. Yes. Now, is the guys from 175 First Ranger Battalion getting work done as always? Second bat, redheaded stepchild. We don't get any of the fun anymore. <laughs> but I'm glad to see Rangers representing. Let's go ahead and take a look. Let's go, baby. Ah, they've melded into each other. Oh yeah, I got the saw. Let's go, 175, Specialist Dante Adams. That's actually very accurate, because uh, typically your most senior private or your tab that who just freshly returned from ranger school is going to operate that squad automatic weapon. And then in hopes, he's going to take a gun team. Yeah. And then after gun team, he's going to take a fire team. This looks like it's around your era, based off the uh, tech. Yeah, exactly, yep. And the there, It looks like Af Afghanistan or something like that. They're and moving they, through that wadi, dude. Hell right, yeah. they got a machine gun position up on the hill, so they're trying to skirt around. They got a JTAC with them. Oh, they even have the lasers on. Look at that, take them out, <laughs> dude. That's awesome. This is Medal of Honor, right? Medal of Honor, yeah. Oh yeah, this is great. 175, they always get the mission. Wait, man. he's got a belt fed, he's got a 249? 249, yeah. All right, there you go. Pretty accurate for the time. Yeah, 175 gets all the cool missions, man. <laughs> 175 and 375. They used to call 275 the red-headed stepchild of the regiment. You guys go go guard that porta potty over there. And I mean... it's because uh, on our deployment cycle, since regiment deployed every year, it was uh, a three to four month deployment. So you would uh, train for seven months, deploy for four, and then do two weeks before deployment and two weeks after for like your leisure time. It's just the timing would always bring 275 on deployment in the middle of winter. And winter isn't fighting season. There's right. seasons overseas for fighting because when it's the weather's good, they want to come out and play. But when it's not, everyone yeah. wants to stay inside and bundle up. Yep. Which is funny because one of the most active times that we saw was during uh, some certain well-revered Middle Eastern holidays. Those when yeah. we would see the most bombings, the most missile attacks. Like, it's a holiday, let's go outside and play. Exactly. Here you go, dude. So I see that he's got a little red dot in that reticle, yep. but I'm gonna take a wild shot in the dark and say, because that reticle is moving as the distance is getting, do you notice that, how the yeah. reticle is moving up? Yep. That's gonna be his laser system that's on, because as it goes out to distance, those steady lines in the optic are gonna equate two different distances. Uh, so as it pushes out further, that dot is gonna adjust based off that straight line. I like the reload animation there. It's good, but it's it's more than just slapping those, <laughs> that, uh, those rounds on there. You gotta really play some precisely and yeah. then you know with two hands mainly it's kind of almost really hard to reload a saw one-handed to place that belt really accurately on that feed tray there because you can place them and just slap a cover but sometimes it'll force a malfunction because they're not properly sat yeah i can tell oh, you're right this is my air this is acus yeah it's mm -hmm. got dcus on there yeah i really like the terrain here it's very accurate yeah that's one thing i love about terrain out in southern california because i feel like this is looks a lot like the mojave desert it's like really Porter good Wind, mm -hmm. you know, there's mountains there's yeah. deserts there's everything you need to simulate afghanistan or iraq <laughs> the old soviet bombed out tanks and stuff just playing there yeah from times before Using the terrain to our advantage, right? Staying, right. staying in that low ground to mask our movement, because we just got, I'm sure they established a base of fire, and now they're maneuvering around. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, Coming up on it, like, from the back end, probably. Yeah, look at these mud huts. Yeah. Fairly accurate. I mean, the rate of fire for the 249 in this game is really accurate. Yeah. It is, and it sounds identical. It's awesome. They did a really good job with the accuracy of the equipment here. Nice. Ooh, watch out for your guy coming in front there. Yeah, watch that bounding, guys. <laughs> we got the shotgun right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, moving too quick. Moving way too quick. Watch those uh, windows, man. Yeah, only move as fast as you can accurately engage, man. Now, I don't know about the times. This, this is an old school Ranger question, and uh, I don't know if we would be using in this type of shotgun. I'm familiar with using the Remington 870 as a breaching tool. The one thing about the shotgun is it only could hold, my shotgun could only hold three rounds, so you'd use two on the door, and uh, you're making that L shape on it. You go 45 sideways, 45 up, and that would eliminate the door breach, so your locking mechanism would have nothing to basically connect to. The second you shot 
two, you needed to put two back in or one. So you're reloading the shotgun every single time you use it. Open spaces like that, because it's not a quick reload. We're not like John Wick over here. The uh, professional like shooting competitions where they use three gun and two gun with shotguns and they're just reloading in one swift hand. We didn't have that. It was just one at a time. And, and you know what? There's, there's a big difference between competition shooting and real world reloading and exactly. shooting. You know? Yeah, I'm not reloading my shotgun until we establish a foothold in a building. I have my privates holding security and I'm just sitting there waiting to prep my movement. So I'm making sure all my equipment's good. Fresh mag in the gun, rounds in the shotgun. Let's go. Clear rear. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't actually be saying like clear right, clear rear. Yeah. You just get in there. It's pretty, if there's no rounds being shot, you know the building's you know clear. clear. <laughs> and rack it afterwards. That's great. <laughs> Close a, lot of, a lot of people think you, in Call of Duties, they rack it first, which you can <laughs> do, but there's links in the gun yeah. that fall, can fall into your chamber there. And the first thing you do, we call it a bless off. So when you pop that thing up, you go, you make a cross and you bless the top of the feed mm -hmm. tray and then clear the feed tray and then place the belt. And once they're on, then you can rack it. Cause if you rack it first, you risk those links falling into your chamber and causing a giant malfunction. Cause yeah. the saw is not the greatest. I don't know why we still use it, but I mean, <laughs> it's not the, the most reliable weapon system. Somebody's got a contract. Let's go, let's get those belt fed contracts up. Yeah, Bravo 1-6, that call sign would refer to Bravo Company, 1st Platoon, and 6 would be the platoon leader. You got one, he's two, got his own number designation? Yeah, his call sign is typically uh, platoon leader's call signs are 6, and the platoon starting would be 7, and then 1, 2, 3, 4 would be your squad leaders. But call signs change all the time because right. uh, you don't want them to know who you are. Exactly, yeah. Oh, yeah. you are danger close. You are way <laughs> in the reds there, buddy. Yeah, they definitely marked that with smoke just to be like, hey, on smoke, <laughs> flatten this. Yeah, that is way too close. <laughs> Typically, if you're calling for fire, you're in targets marked with rings. So like, you know what your safe designation for space to be is based off those distances of rings. Typically, if you're gonna call for fire, especially being, what, 150, 150 meters that they said <laughs> there were, they're so close. That would ring their bells. So you wanna put like a, a major terrain feature or be outside that distance, you're gonna call for fire like that. That's a Medal of Honor type Well, so yep. here, here we are. Here we are. Oh, wait, he's got a strobe? Yeah. yeah. So that was Top of the helmet? Yep, top of the helmet strobe. So ISR assets, which is your planes flying in the sky, marking locations and giving you a giving you real-time information on the enemy. They can see friendly positions based off an IR strobe. Where are we going now? We took care of the machine gun. Now we're kind of going off, right, off by ourselves. LZ. Move to okay. LZ Betty. Yeah, you definitely got to give a BDA, which is a battle damage assessment, after those call for fires, uh, just to see, you know, impacts, <laughs> effects on target, essentially. Because if you got to do it again, it'd be like, repeat. That's why you also don't say repeat last on the radio. Say again. Yeah, it's say again, because repeat is a call basically saying to fire on this objective again. Don't say repeat over the radio, because they will drop another bomb on it. Mm -hmm. Also, it doesn't seem to be a bipod on this 249, which is a little silly. <laughs> This guy just works out. Yeah, got a lot of forearm stamina. Does a lot of double unders. <laughs> Tell us in the comments, what kind of tank is that? I wanna know, I know you know. Someone knows. Someone knows. Someone knows, come in. I'm gonna get the Russian accent in every single Gameology video from now on. Has to, it's your trademark. <laughs> you have rules in America. Да, два чувака против целого взвода. Why am I Russian again? <laughs> All the Russians are like, you? Yeah, hand grenades are an excellent tool in the fire team. I mean, you're talking about a weapon that can produce a five meter kill radius. So in groups of people where they're all fighting undercover, you know, frag grenades do a lot of damage and will help you in a firefight environment such as this. The only thing is they can be thrown back at you. And I mean, anything that you use can be used against you. You got different kinds. You got the frag grenade, Sendier, smoke grenades, smoke grenades. Sendier grenades, yeah. Flashbang grenades, which is something that I used a lot when I was in country. Yeah, if you're yeah. in overseas, you have multiple grenades on you. You're carrying a lot because they are a great tool and they do have a lot of advantages, especially like barricaded shooters or even dudes out here in the open. Let's go! <laughs> so I just want to wake everybody up. My ears! The guy with the headphones on. Is it winter time or is it just Afghanistan up in the mountains? It's <laughs> Afghanistan in the mountains. <laughs> it's moving really methodically in this year. You're, you're in a bounding overwatch type of environment, which is typically, there's different types of movements that you would use in a tactical environment. You have moving, you have moving overwatch, and then you got bounding overwatch. And let me confirm that in my knowledge packet. <laughs> 
Overwatch. I was one, the bounding Overwatch. I remember. But oh, what's you got the other one? It's moving not moving. Overwatch? It's traveling, traveling, traveling Overwatch. Overwatch and bounding. Overwatch. Okay, let's do that again. I get at least second one. You know, I'm still going to the last. All right, yeah. When you're moving in this type of situation, you're definitely utilizing one of three tactical movements. So you have traveling, traveling Overwatch, and bounding Overwatch. In this type of situation, where contact is imminent or you've already taken contact, bounding Overwatch is going to be your your preferred method of moving, which mm -hmm. is you have an element providing security while the other one moves, sets, provides security, and they move. And you can't move unless you're providing fire because the difference between moving and maneuvering is moving as you're going from point A to point B. Maneuvering is you're going from point A to point B with a base of fire. Pretty good accuracy for that saw going way that, that far out there. Yeah, man, I mean, back to the saw qualification ranges, you were hitting target. I think the furthest target you had to qualify on with the saw is 500 meters. Mm. And it's a, a group of three E-types that would be the body-shaped targets. Mm -hmm. And they would pop up in a group and you'd have to engage them for 500 meters. That's why, honestly, putting a magnified optic on a saw was kind of uh, was more of an advantage because I ran an EOTech on my saw and I started mm -hmm. to struggle when we started to get out to distance because obviously with a red dot at 500 meters, everything kind of is absorbed by that light. But with mm. a magnified optic like the LCAN, or even the one that he's using, you can reach out and touch people. Goddamn turkey shoot out here. Yeah, I was gonna say, <laughs> you know, you, you hear about these engagements, there's like four or five Marines, platoon of Marines or platoon of, you know, Rangers, and they take, you know, they take five guys or 12 guys, and it's like, and then you hear about the other side, they're like 1,500 guys down. <laughs> Like, oh uh, yeah, man. <laughs> because there is the training, the weaponry, you know, the tactics and stuff. It really makes a big difference. It absolutely does. Especially if you're fighting an unconventional force, just like a bunch of, you know, goat herders and farmers out there. Right. With no real tactics, just running around. Like chickens with their head cut off, you can really do some damage. I mean, you heard about that operation that was published in the news about the special operations unit that uh, killed 300 Russian mercenaries mm. just from one gun position. Mm -hmm. I was supposed to be on that mission. What? <laughs> yeah, I didn't oh, tell you that. No way. Oh. That was my mission, but it got taken away from me. Oh, I was yeah. pissed. And they're having like privates fucking lighting cigarettes off the smoking <laughs> barrels of the 240s, <laughs> just in between Merc and Russian mercenaries. <laughs> That was great, uh, I'm man. Impressed. I'm impressed, Cameron. Uh, Rangers do lead the way, my friend. Yes, we do. Thanks for admitting that. <laughs> but 175, as always, putting in work. Great to see. That was great, man. I love that reaction. If you want to see more videos like this, check out Gameology on Facebook and YouTube. Also, if you guys want to take a look at my personal brand, Kick God, go on Instagram at Kick God Apparel. It's a brand with a great cause, supporting communities out here in Los Angeles. And if you want to hang out with me a little bit more, go to twitch.tv slash myhappyself. And if you want to listen to us talk about all things pop culture, go to pop culture field manual podcast on anywhere where podcasts are available that's pcfm podcast check it out and we'll see you next time those look like some tour so that uh, it looks like some sort of art what the hell is this mission called <laughs> more time from the top yeah let's the tippers yep. okay cool if you guys want to check out more videos like this check out yeah i said check out yeah, twice yeah.